My favorite things to talk about up here are the things I learned that I was wrong about. I used to worry that I'd run out of those things. But I don't really worry about that anymore. Being wrong about things about God puts you in some pretty good company. The Gospels are full of scenes where Jesus tells a simple story and the twelve scratch their heads and Jesus has to take them aside and really spell things out. The apostles responsible for the Gospels are perfectly happy to tell us these stories about themselves. For example, uh, read one for you here. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves if you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets full you picked up? Or the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets full you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but the teaching of the Pharisees. And we read that today and it's easy to feel smug. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about yeast. But we can be just as confused. Because Jesus has this habit of blowing our minds. For an example, if I come to dinner in your house and hold up a loaf of bread and I say, this is my body, <laughs> you can be pretty sure that Bill means this is a metaphor. <laughs> but Jesus... Here's a guy, say you're a disciple, and you've been following him around, and one day you see him take some mud and spit in it and fashion new eyes for a blind man, and now I can see. And now Jesus is holding up a loaf of bread and saying, this is my body broken for you. What does that guy mean? Roman Catholicism teaches that bread is transformed, that it becomes his body, that Jesus is sacrificed at every mass. Luther said it's both bread and Jesus. Zwingli zeroed in on the do this in remembrance of me part and said, no, it's just bread. Calvin said that in communion, the believer is nourished spiritually and physically without any need for the bread to change. If you ask the average believer today what's going on with communion, they're likely to give an answer anywhere in that range or even something entirely different. The point is there is literally no end to the possibility of what an infinite God is capable of. Our best bet, then, is whenever it's possible to let Jesus explain Jesus, to let Scripture interpret Scripture, to let the context of a passage determine its meaning. What a passage means to me is far less important than what God meant by the revelation. But even knowing all this, I still mess up, and the thing I was wrong about that I want to talk about today has to do with completely missing the context of a well-known verse. That verse is Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Which, if you've been paying attention to neither of the lectionary readings, <laughs> yes, no. and I have a funny story about that. You could go to church for 40 years and not know what the lectionary is, hypothetically, not speaking from experience. Uh, so let me explain what the lectionary is. It's just a list of scripture readings to be read on certain days. Some churches like ours use it to guide scriptures that will be read and preached on each Sunday. It's designed to take you through the Bible in three years. You can tell which year you're in by which gospel you're studying. We've been looking at Luke, so we're in the third year of the lectionary. Next year, it'll start over with Matthew, year after that, Mark, and back to Luke again. The Gospel of John is interspersed through there. The great thing about the lectionary is that it keeps pre preachers from just teaching from their favorite passages, and it exposes the church to potentially all of the scripture. I say potentially because there are multiple passages for each Sunday. For today, there's the gospel passage and six more. We typically only read two passages together. So, Terry uses the lectionary, but until today, I preached on whatever was on my heart. But someone had made that point again to me recently about the value of the lectionary in pushing preachers out of their comfort zone. And it struck me that might be a good thing as 
of time, so I determined to do that, and I went and looked up the passage from Luke that was set for today, and it turns out today's passage is the same passage I preached on in my very first sermon here three years ago. God likes to have fun with me like that. The story about the demoniac and the garrison is one of my favorites, because if you back up just a little bit and start with Jesus calming the storm, you have this epic journey of Jesus commanding the forces of nature and then taking on 6,000 demons, a legion, all to rescue one guy. It's the action-adventure version of the prodigal son. This time the father in Christ comes after his lost son who is so far gone he'll never be able to return on his own. Our God is an awesome God. But the whole point of the lectionary is to not just dwell on favorite stuff. So I turn to the other passages for today. Now there's something else you need to know about the lectionary, and it's another funny story. One of the earliest memories I have of going to church is trying to figure out what the two scripture readings have to do with each other. I always just assumed that they were paired together because they go together somehow. So here I am, 12 years old, maybe flipping back and forth between the Old Testament and the New Testament, trying to find the thread that connects uh, them without a clue that there's actually no guarantee that there is one. <coughs> Unless the preacher chooses the alternate reading for the day, which sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. The alternate reading is paired on purpose with the gospel reading in order to highlight some aspect of the text. The alternate reading for today was the Isaiah passage we read. Listen to it again and see if you can spot the connecting idea. It's, in, it's just in the first two verses. It's I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. In both readings, God is standing, saying, here I am, in the midst of a people hell-bent on their own pursuits. But the people are totally different. The Gerasenian pig herders are most likely Gentiles because of the part of the country we're in, because there were laws in Israel about associating with pigs. Their trouble with Jesus is he just sunk a substantial economic asset into the sea for the sake of this frightening guy in the cemetery that they'd managed to figure out a way to live with. If they'd been good Presbyterians and formed a committee beforehand, <laughs> to evaluate the situation and the impact on the local I think the Gerasenians would have expressed the position beforehand. It sounded something like this. Listen, we can live with the 6,000 demons, just let us keep the pigs. <laughs> the people God's calling out to in Isaiah are different. They're his nation, Israel and Judah in particular. The people who he already rescued, not once, but many, many times. They're people who think they've got to figure it out. But Isaiah is telling them things they don't like about a God they've managed to figure out a way to live with. The Gerasenians figured out a way to live with a legion of demons by kind of corralling them into this one part of their community. Judah had figured out a way to live with an all-powerful God by basically corralling the relationship with rules and expectations beyond God's requirements. We promise to do this, wash before meals, our business outside the king, don't eat pork. If you promise to do these other things, make it rain, not too much. Give us lots of well-behaved children and more sheep than we can count, please. But Yahweh is no small-minded pagan God. He has no need of our rituals or our offerings or our words. He's after something he values much, much more. This all reminds me of Jesus' letter to the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation. John has this terrifying encounter where he's transported to heaven into the presence of the risen glorified Christ. Jesus' head is shining white and his eyes are blazing with fire. And his feet are glowing like molten metal. He's holding seven stars in his right hand and his face is shining like the sun. He speaks and his voice is like a waterfall. And he says, John, let this down. John says, okay. <laughs> Actually, John says nothing. He, falls, he just falls down dead. Like he did. 
and this glowing molten Jesus touches John on the ground and says, do not be afraid. John says, okay. I'm the first and the last, Jesus says. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive for all eternity and I hold the keys of death and hell. Write what you see. Okay. The first thing Jesus has him record are seven letters to seven churches. Most are a mix of warning and encouragement. But the last letter to Laodicea is the one you don't want to have Jesus write to your church. I'll read it. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 16 or so. 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are not a cold nor hot. I wish that you were a cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I shall to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. I stand at what door? Before, when I thought of this verse, I pictured the door of a home the home of a humble non-believer who felt like God had rejected her, who felt like he had good reasons to do so, someone who felt unlovable, someone who hasn't met Christ yet. There are other passages where Jesus reaches out to the person I'm describing and promises love and forgiveness and acceptance no matter what a person is past. But this verse isn't it, because what door is Jesus knocking at? The church door. It's curious though, right? What kind of church would Jesus not be welcoming? A church with people like the people we read about this morning. A people who are comfortable with the relational boundaries they've set up between themselves and Yahweh and the demons. A church where people feel like things are pretty much working okay. A church where when Jesus shows up blazing like fire, grabbing hold of lightning bolts and shining a spotlight on the 6,000 demons hiding like cockroaches cracks and crevices. When molten Jesus shows up at that church, that church says, this isn't the deal we had. We'll be, we'll, we'll be well-behaved people, and you be a well-behaved God. And for Pete's sake, you cleaned up this guy, so we have one more mouth to feed, and now no pigs. Please go away, you're wrecking everything. Do you want that Jesus to come into your life? into your community, into your worship. You know those icebreakers, uh, who would you invite to a dinner party? So anybody from history. And usually at church you have to say anybody except Jesus because everybody would say Jesus. <clears throat> and what we mean is loving, doe-eyed, flowing, brown-haired, Caucasian Jesus who dislikes the same behavior we dislike and can live with the same behavior we can live with and likes that I went and did that mission project six months ago. But there's a blazing, molten face shining like the sun, Jesus, standing at the door saying, what's it going to be, me or the pigs? And please, to be absolutely clear, the pigs in the story are not a who, not a personality type, not a people group, but a what. What are you using in your life to keep God at a comfortable distance? It could be material things like the Gerasenians. It could be good works like Judah. What deals and understandings do you think you have with God? What's got your heart? What are you afraid of all that star wielding Jesus might destroy? Before you condemn the Gerasenians for choosing the pigs, ask yourself what you're willing to give up in order for Jesus to come into someone else's life in power. Someone who you don't like. Someone you think is way beyond reach. 
Because whatever it is you're not willing to part with, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming after that thing. Jesus is no small-minded thing to God. He has no need of your rituals or your offerings or your words. He's after something he values much, much more. He's after your love, your passion, your desires, your thoughts, your daydreams, your hopes. He's after your heart because you, bride of Christ, have his. And when he asks for your heart today, tomorrow, an hour from now, I hope you look at your pigs and say, 